As the head of the Health and Technology Innovation Center at Christiana Care, Catherine is responsible for creating an environment that accelerates idea generation and innovation. To date, the Innovation Center has developed more than 35 custom applications. Each app started as a project initiated because of a unique opportunity, an idea from a member of the Christiana Care team to introduce improvements and deficiencies in a way not offered commercially. With over 20 years of technology industry, in, in the technology industry, Catherine has earned several professional distinctions and honors from IT professional associations and journals, such as Information Week magazine's 20 Great Ideas to Steal, I thought it said share, but we're gonna go with steal, and Computer World's Honors Program Top 5 recognition. Catherine received a bachelor's degree from the University of Delaware and an MS from Wilmington University. She also holds several <coughs> certifications in usability and user experience, one of them being CSX, CMX. You'll have to tell me about that, I puzzled that. So anyway, Catherine Birch. Thank you. CXA, does anybody know what that, that means? I know there's one person because there's somebody in here that's also. Certified User Experience Analyst. So there is such a thing from a human factors perspective, user experience, that you get certified in how do you make usable things. So I'll tell you a little bit about that as, as we go on. Um, so thank you for the great introduction. Yes, I'm Katherine Birch, and I am from the Health and Technology Innovation Center at Christiana Care. We're located at Wilmington. Um, so we are in the Gateway Building, for those of you familiar with our Wilmington campus. We just moved there a little less than two years ago. Previously, we were at Reed's Way in the Corporate Commons complex. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about innovation. I'm going to talk to you about it in general. So my goal here is that you leave with a good understanding of what's happening in the innovation space, both healthcare related and non-healthcare related. And then we'll talk about some things that are disrupting in the future of healthcare. And then after the break, I thought we'll go a little bit into what the Innovation Center does specifically at Christiana Care. So I thought first, as we think about innovation, I thought what, what would come to mind for folks when you think about innovation? And I thought maybe Silicon Valley, that's very often what people will say. Sometimes people will say Steve Jobs or they'll say Apple when they think innovation. Thomas Edison, which I was surprised that I didn't realize that Thomas Edison looked so dapper. <laughs> Some might think innovation is products such as WD-40. And the reason that I bring that up is because in all of those examples, it's about failure, failing fast, WD-40. It was the 40th attempt at a product, and that is where the name comes from. But in all of those, Edison, it took so many tries to create the light bulb. But I think you know, what you'll often hear, especially in Silicon Valley, you know, it was a founder of Twitter that said it took 10 years to look like an overnight success. So innovation takes a long time. But I have set you all up for this great innovator because I want to take a poll to see if anybody knows who this is. And I'll give you a few hints, but the first person to shout out who it is, I have a gift for you. Okay, so one hint I'll tell you is that he wears the same shirt and pants so that he doesn't have to think about what to wear. He loves denim, denim shirts, denim pants. He is the creator of Coca-Cola Freestyle, if you didn't know that that's what the Coke machine was called. Coke, now you'll know when you go in, oh, they have a Coke Freestyle machine. But what he's most well known for, and he has done such amazing work from a medical invention perspective, but what he is most known for is the Segway. Does anyone know Yay, we got one. Okay, Dean Kamen. So I have a prize for you. My colleague, Jason, is gonna get that right to you. But Dean Kamen, that is a great inventor. I love sharing his stories because if you look him up, 
He has done amazing things and no one knows his name. And he's still doing amazing things now, not just the Segway or Coke Freestyle. He agreed to do Coke Freestyle with Coca-Cola if they would fund a project he was doing in Africa for clean water. So it was a deal that he made in order to do that for them. So innovation, innovation, it, the definition is really, it's implementing something new, but it's not the shiny object. It's not, that would be cool. Innovation has to add value and, and very specific quantifiable gain. And that's hard sometimes, that's hard for people to identify it yet because sometimes innovation is just so crazy that you didn't know that you couldn't live without it when it first came out. Innovation requires risk, it requires persistence, and that's that example of 10 years. 10 years to be an overnight success. It's so true that things are happening very often you don't know it. Or as we talk through the night, when you think about, you know, how does the room feel about autonomous vehicles, driverless cars? Exactly, thumbs down. But it's coming, that's probably what people felt about the automobile. You know, and that's the challenge with innovation is that it does require persistence. It requ and in Silicon Valley, at last report, they said only one in 10 startups survives. And that's the persistent ones that really survive. So it's the risk taking, and that's also a new concept for certain industries, especially healthcare. That it's that, that freedom to fail, and f if you're going to fail, fail fast, but in this risk averse industry, we don't wanna fail. We want to do what we know absolutely will work, what the evidence shows will work. And you're seeing a big shift now. You're seeing that shift of fail fast, fail safe. You know, we're not saying that there, there's significant risk, but it's, you might be running things in parallel. You might be consuming more resources to try something, even though you know there's a good likelihood it won't work, but you'll learn from it and you can pivot to a really good solution. So that example that I was giving about the automobile, so there was a very famous quote from Ford that said, if I had asked people what they wanted, anybody know the end of that one? They would have said faster horses. <laughs> and that's where usability comes in. That's where user experience comes in because it's observing the user. So even though I'm not asking the user what they want, I'm observing them and understanding what are their needs, what are the problems, what's the value that they could get from this innovation. So when you think about that, you think about, okay, the horse-drawn carriage. So this is Park Avenue, Easter, 1905. So it's very hard to see. I was thinking, when were cameras even invented? So I'm, I'm, it's good to have a picture from that time in any quality. But that circle is the lone automobile, 1905 New York City on Easter Sunday. Now you fast forward, this is 1913, so this is eight years later, all automobiles, one horse-drawn carriage. To them, it probably felt like overnight, all of a sudden, everyone's using automobile, and it probably felt like the autonomous vehicle, where it was probably, are you crazy? I'll stick with my horse. I'm not getting in that automobile. But, it, and again, it's so innovation. Sometimes it feels like things are moving so slow. Other times it feels like overnight. What, how did it happen? But it's the craziness, because think about that. How many of you looked at this kind of phone and said, man, I wish this took pictures. I wish I could take my phone on vacation. But that's the key, is it's a crazy idea, but in the end, who could have predicted the value that now, I mean, so many people now probably don't even own a camera or haven't bought a camera, a digital camera for two, three years now with the quality on the phones. So now I'm gonna take that, that example because when we think about the horse-drawn carriage and the automobile example, 1905, 1913. This is another eight-year example, 2005 and 2013. So this was a viewing with the Pope and in 2005, no phones. No one had the phones out. And look at that, again, eight years later, seemingly how innovation spread so fast. I mean, that's fast. In eight years, it seems like almost every single person is using a phone. 
And then you have that one person using the iPad. You all know that person, or you might be that person that records the stuff with your iPad or takes the photos with your iPad. It's a good big screen. But again, it's amazing. In eight years, you turn around. When did that happen? Did it happen in 2006 or seven? It's the early adopters, the risky people that were willing to invest. I'm going to get that iPhone. No, no, I love my Blackberry. I'm not, I don't want to give up my pager. You know, and think about, there, I think everybody probably knows somebody that still held on to that flip phone or that pager or that I see some, some guilty looks here <laughs> or that might still have it. Maybe um, I should say that. But that's the key is that it takes early adopters. It takes people, the, the people in our lives that love the gadgets, that love. They're the ones that are creating this culture of innovation. They're the ones advancing us because they're willing to try it. And they're OK if it's not perfect. That's the key. Because how many times have you maybe updated the version on your phone? Oh, and it keeps crashing. Or I just got this new device and I can't figure it out. It's not behaving the way my old one used to. It's people that embrace that. It's OK, because if you have it perfect when you roll it out, you waited too long. You need to get something out there, get feedback from users to then keep building on what's important for them. And let me know, I'm turning my head. I want to make sure my mic doesn't, I'm not cutting it in out for you. So another great example is the taxi cab industry. So what do you think the person that came up with this idea, why do we need Uber? We have the ability to call a taxi, hail a taxi. How's that innovative? There's already a solution for that. I need a ride. I'm going to call. Maybe I'm going to get a bus or other public transportation. And not to mention the fact Aren't we taught not to talk to strangers? Now we're going to tell them where we live. We're going to potentially give them access to our bank account or our credit card and get in a car with them. So who were the people that chose to use Uber when it first launched? It sounds even crazy saying it now, but people did. And it caught on and it caught on. And the funny thing is, where does that catch on? Silicon Valley. San Francisco, the West Coast, because they have that spirit of, I'll try it, sure. I'll, you know, right now, we've been looking at Waze Carpool. OK, so I'm not doing an Uber. So now I'm really catching a ride. I'm meeting somebody on a corner to catch a ride, because they posted that they're going to Wilmington. For $5, they'll drive me and drop me off at a corner. No, so now I'm thinking, if I was was uncomfortable with weight with Lyft or Uber. Now I'm going to trust somebody that I don't even know. Do I know they even have car insurance or that they've been vetted at all? But we'll turn around and that's probably going to take off. That'll be the next thing that you don't need to be a driver of Uber or Lyft. You're just a neighbor and we both work in the city. Let's ride together and do a ride share. But what's interesting is again, Airbnb. I'm going to sleep at your house. I don't even know you. And now I'm in your house. Crazy idea. And if you haven't heard that story of Airbnb, it was a couple of designers in San Francisco. There was a design conference. All the hotel rooms were sold out. And they said, you know how we can make money? What if we took our air mattress, blew it up, put it in our, our living room, and we posted that we've got a bed available? And so that's, that's the business. Now, how they sold that business model to anyone? Air b and B, air mattress b and B. That sounds ridiculous. But again, now we're letting strangers in our home. It's, it's so bizarre, but it takes those early adopters to really advance innovation. Now, so speaking of early adopters, so this is a this is a supermarket chain, and their invention, their new innovation is while you're waiting for the subway. So if you can see what he's doing, he's shopping, but it's a digital screen outside the train station. So he's scanning what he wants from the grocery store, so that by the time he arrives home on the train, it'll be waiting for him at his front door. Now. 
If you're like me, I would say, I need to check the expiration dates. I need to make sure it's the cheapest option. It's the brand that I want. It's the best value. But things like that, and then think about it, because so many of our grocery stores have been offering delivery, and now Walmart's offering it, Target's offering it, and a lot of people would say, no, I need to touch, I need to touch the fruit. I need to pick what I want. But that, that rapid convenience, that is happening. That's, that's the future. That's what you're gonna see a lot, that you're not doing that same retail. We see it now with Amazon and you know, shopping online for clothing, but it's funny because now you're seeing it and really, so before you go to a website, pick your things, now they're taking it to you. You don't even have to go to the website, you're standing waiting anyway, so pretty smart that you're waiting. This same chain also came up with the innovation, instead of express checkout, they made a slow checkout. So they did that because they were listening to their users, they felt rushed. 15 items are like, no, I need a lane where no one's gonna rush me, and that was their target audience, and so that's, they were trying something different. So now we'll talk a little bit about healthcare innovation specifically. Now, healthcare, it is a time of disruption in healthcare. You've seen it already. You know, why can I make my hair appointment online, but I cannot make my appointment with my doctor online? Or, you know, why, why is it that I have convenience in other ways? Why can I order my groceries from Acme, but I can't get, you know, something else delivered for me? You know, my medical equipment, things like that. And so we're really going through that disruption where those examples that I gave from a Silicon Valley perspective are coming into healthcare. So this is about, this is information from 2018 from Venture Scanner. But they are a research platform. They are tracking over 2,000 health tech startups. So there are tons of companies trying to disrupt healthcare right now with over $64 billion in funding. So that's huge. It's coming in healthcare. And so health systems need to keep pace. And, and that's, that's our goal. That's why we have innovation centers, because we're really trying to partner with these these startups, and we're trying to help them also pivot because a lot of times it's maybe two founders that have no health tech, health care, any kind of medical background, but they just know they're a patient or their, their family member's a patient, they have an idea. Why is this so hard? Why can't it be better? That's where the partnerships are great because then we can partner with them and give them the clinical perspective and the regulatory perspective and so on, and it makes a great, great partnership. And when we look at some of these startups, you might be surprised at what's considered a startup, 23andMe. Wow, that's a start, because they're, they're a successful company, but you see, you know, 20, 2018, they were considered still young and trying to gain traction. I'm looking to see if there's any other that are really common now, because again, we might look at this a year from now and some of them will not be on the list anymore. And then they'll be completely different names. Not so long ago, Fitbit was on here. So, disruption. So really, what specifically is disruption? It is something that's displacing an existing market. So something like healthcare, the healthcare industry. It can be something new, or it can be just something more efficient. That's the key, but it has to be worthwhile. So again, it's not what, what some would call you know, the shiny object syndrome. Oh, Apple Watch, that's so awesome. We need to use that. But why, why do we need to use that? What's the value? And so a lot of times it takes a while. A great example is you know, a Google Glass or the Oculus Rift, a, a virtual reality headset. That's great, it holds great potential. It's great to have ideas, but you've gotta try them out in small bits to find out where the value is and if it really is disruptive because just offering something new for the sake of doing something new is not innovation at all. So it's destructive to some, but it is creative innovation. So when you think about even what's happening with, from a Fitbit perspective versus an Apple Watch, you know, two wearables, you could argue pretty comparable, maybe for some people, 
that are doing it to track specific things, but they're disrupting each other. They're trying to compete. But again, disruption, it all takes persistence, 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 and it is risky. So when you go into your physician's office and they say, would you be willing to trial that? We're doing a, 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 an initiative where, and, and this is a true story, that we were running a pilot to use Google Glass in our primary care offices, select primary care offices. So when you went in to see your physician, they would be wearing Google Glass, so it's a computer eyeglass combination, and there was a scribe on the other end. So when your physician was, do, was really talking to you about your care, having your appointment, somebody on the other end was looking in your chart and teeing up information. Oh, remind John, it's time for his flu shot, or you know, ask John as a follow-up to his last visit. And this surprisingly, so some may say, oh, that feels like an invasion of privacy. Somebody else was there, but I can't see them. But feedback was great on that because the physician was now able to make more face-to-face -face contact. So now the physician's talking to you face-to-face, -face, not with their back turned, updating your information on the computer or pulling your information up on the computer, but it took those patients that were willing to say yes to that to, to find those results out and to get the results. Now, from a healthcare perspective, so you're seeing more robotics. So now you might be seeing, so robotic surgery has been around. Now you're starting to see robots used from a provider perspective. So, you know, you're maybe a patient on the intensive care unit. The specialist is now not walking into the room, but the robot is rolling into the room to give you care because that gets you more access to specialists. So it's a good thing, but again, right now we're probably in that in-between point where, no, I just, I need someone there. I need someone physically there. And that, you're really seeing that shift, that maybe it's not that I need to see someone there, I just want the best provider that I can get, even if they're coming through on a robot. The VR example, so this is one of my team members in the cancer center. So the, he is using a virtual reality headset, an Oculus Rift, with a patient undergoing infusion. And so again, that felt, that could have failed. You know, our, our key with that was, we in the Innovation Center, we're always looking at the latest technology and looking for good use cases. How can we use it to prove out the value? Or scrap it, because there's, there's no value in that yet. And the Oculus Rift was something that we were looking at. We said, okay, you're seeing all the headlines, virtual reality in healthcare, the great promise there. And really, we were struggling with, okay, but the rea sometimes you'd see a story about, you know, somebody's up on a ladder viewing schematics with the heads. No, 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 no. Do you want to be on a ladder where you can't see? What, you know, this is immersive. You basically have on, your, everything in your site is blocked except what's presented on the screen. But somebody had an idea. So a family member was undergoing infusion and they said, it can just get so boring. You're there, you're there all the time and now you're, you're feeling anxiety and stress because you're sitting and there's nothing really that's different for you to look at. How many times can you look at the fountain outside? And so what we did is we built an app for positive distraction therapy. And so that's running in the cancer center right now. But we had to prove it out and it could have failed. Because how do you keep a device meant for, you know, teenagers sometimes in the home? How do you keep that clean in a hospital setting? Or how do you disrupt the nurse's flow? So now we want the nurses to know how to use a gaming laptop. So the nurses now have to man an Alienware laptop with this Oculus Rift headset. Oculus Rift is a Facebook product and we want them to understand how to use the app. So, so much to prove out there. We took it baby steps and at every step it could have failed and we would have scrapped it. That's the difference you're seeing now in innovation. That risk taking is also, we're okay spending two weeks on this to prep this 
knowing it could fail. And it, and it will fail. More times than not, things fail, but it's really how you look at it. Because with every failure, you're learning and then you're changing it up a little bit. Changing it up and then deciding at some point, okay, there's, there's no good use case for this, no good situation. We've ruled everything out. But often, it's just not yet. So we might come back to it, but, but that's the key when you think about that, because there were so many things, so many points in that process that could have been failure points. So it's that, that kind of risk taking in that case. Now I'm going to show you a video because, so here's another healthcare innovation. And this is a good example of machine learning and the future of healthcare. So this is a product. And I am going to hit this video. Bear with me. Actually, if the spinning wheel doesn't stop, OK. Every year, 1.5 million people die from lung cancer. Three people break a bone every second due to osteoporosis. These and many other medical conditions can be prevented if discovered early enough using CTs, X-rays, and MRIs. What if you could teach computers to provide faster, more accurate diagnosis based on the combined wisdom and experience of thousands of radiologists? Zebra Medical Vision introduces revolutionary technology based on advanced machine and deep learning. Thousands of previously diagnosed cases are uploaded to our analytics engine, teaching it to create unique algorithms that can identify the visual fingerprints of multiple diseases. Then, when shown a new scan, it instantly recognizes that fingerprint and alerts of the disease. Zebra Medical Vision is giving healthcare a breakthrough tool to help millions of people receive faster, more affordable quality care. Zebra Medical Vision, the future of medical imaging. So another great example, oh, hold on, let me get us back to where we were here. What's that one? But Zebra Medical Vision, so, you know, for those of you thinking about medical school, or for those of you that are in medical careers, you know, how do you feel about that? So you're not doing the diagnosis, you're trusting the computer. Or for all of us as patients, you, so you trust the computer to do that, but yeah, probably because there's so much information that probably is the future and the more accurate. But the key there is, I mean, it is here. It is absolutely here and, and people are using it and you're going to see that more and more. But you may not know that as the patient, but for those of you going into careers in healthcare, it looks very different and we'll talk a little bit about that before we go on the break. But again, I mean, just healthcare is just changing. We are undergoing huge changes, but you're seeing it in small ways. You're seeing it in the healthcare clinic in Walgreens or in Walmart or in CVS. These, you know, the, the clinic. So, you know, what happened to your family doctor? Now you can just go, it's your convenience, it's where you are. And that's changing healthcare because guess what? If you can't make an appointment, with me, I know you're gonna go there. And I'm losing that relationship with you. And we have a long-standing relationship that we wanna keep. So it's just interesting as these disruptors are popping up. And then you have things like this. So this is really crowdsourcing your diagnosis. So you can post your test results and your information on this website and experts from around the world will diagnose you. So really interesting, you want a second opinion? You can post it here. And look, there's rewards. So for, this, for these symptoms, I've put a $1,000 bounty on this if you can diagnose this based on 31-year-old male, nausea after eating and drinking, I mean, imagine that. Now, what this is, is in order to be qualified as an expert, you are vetted, 
but some of their experts are med students. So it's not physicians or other specialists or other clinicians, but you just have to pass their vetting process. But isn't that interesting that, you know, there's a $20,000 reward for Jane's symptoms over there, that now she's trusting. So when you think about these you know, Reddit or Facebook, where, you know, you can post and people will give you their opinion. No, this is, this is a real opinion by vetted experts, according to CrowdMed, but really just a different way. And now think about the role of the physician. So now the physician's new life is, here's my 23andMe results. What do you think of my DNA sequencing? Or here's my, here's what, you know, this expert said they think I have. Or of course, the here's what I think I have from WebMD or from Googling it. So the life of a physician is very different now with all of these resources available. And then you have the home health data. Forget about that. You know, I've, I've gone to my doctor and said, are you interested in seeing, seeing my activity? No, that's OK. You keep that. So it's interesting because you think as a patient, I've got all this great data that I want to make available. And that's a period of transition for us now. What do we do with all this data as healthcare providers? And now we're happy to announce you can even get your Christiana Care data if you have an Apple device. So if you have an iPhone, you're able to sync that up. So now you can see your test results and your specific Christiana Care information. It's a really, really great tool if you haven't enabled that yet through Apple Health. And then, of course, when we think about disruption in healthcare, you have things like this popping up. So forget about my co-pays and trying to find a, the right provider for me. I can just go online to Teladoc, pay $13 for my annual membership, and now I have a doctor. Virtual, but I have a doctor. $45 per console, but that's, that's pretty good. But those kinds of things are different. Not to mention all the pop-up clinics and you know, the, the medical aid units that you're seeing popping up that are just standalone, not associated with a health system per se, but maybe just a chain of minute clinic kind of solutions. So the future of healthcare. So these are all, those, everything I just showed you is there. It's out there. It's real. It's happening. But in the future, now when you think about, our, our goal is rapid convenience for you. So a lot of the innovations happening are focused around the user. It's not about the clinician. It's more about you. And what is going to make it easier for you? Because guess what? You have a lot of choices. You can go to that Teladoc option, but we want to provide you with a virtual option. We want to provide you with that rapid convenience. Now, when you think about this, so these are the types of things that we're keeping our eye out. Because this is, in this case, this is, an auto this is a concept, but it's an autonomous vehicle that is going to your house now. So no one's driving, the autonomous clinic is now pulling up in your driveway that all you need to do is step out, come into the, the vehicle, and it will do all of your scanning, do your appointment, et cetera. So now there's not a person, it's at your home. And this is great if you don't have a computer or wireless or you don't have, maybe you're not even at your home, you're somewhere else that you need this service. But that's the concept, radical convenience, that you're coming in, it's got all of your vitals, you're able to do a visit inside, but now you don't have to worry about, I had to download something, I had to make sure my computer worked, or I had to find a private spot, that kind of thing. And really, future of healthcare is machine learning. It is, it is leveraging that and it's really, as I said, you know, the key is all of this data. As I just said, the home health data. And then we've got the, the 23andMe data. And then we've got your regular data that, that you've always had. But all of these things are coming because now your watch is feeding in these alerts. And who's looking at them? You're looking at them, but are you comfortable with that? And now we're seeing that more. So we are seeing more and more the hot health Career data scientist. That is 
So if you're not interested in a career in healthcare, or your family members are getting ready to go to school, or you're getting ready to go to school, and you're kind of deciding what you want to do from a college perspective, data scientist is the future. That's going to be, right now, security is huge from a healthcare perspective because we are getting all of this data and you're consuming it in all different ways and we've got to protect it in any way that you're consuming it. That's right now, but the future is going to be, what do we do now that we have all that, it's secure, what are we going to do with all this data? How can we make meaningful predictions and take better care of you? And how do we help you take better care of yourself? But a lot of people say, well, but you're losing the human connection. No, I need to go in and see my doctor. I need a relationship. I need, I'm sick. I want somebody to look at this on my body, look down my throat, look in my ears. But, so just like that virtual reality example, we were worried when, that was one of the things we had to test out because we said, this feels cold. It feels like you're coming in for infusion and now we're putting this headset on you. Now you can't see, you can't hear. It almost, we don't want people to feel like we're doing that so that you're not asking questions or you know, you're okay sitting there by yourself. It's so not that. What we found in that case is it brought people together because as soon as they were done, they wanted to talk about it. Oh my gosh, that reminded me of a time when you know, growing up I had a, a place in the mountains. Technology is connecting people, so it's not something to be concerned, oh, now we're putting the technology and now I'm going to miss out on the human interaction. This is such a great quote because really the point here is not thinking about technology versus human, it's replacing. It's so not replacing, absolutely not. In our lifetimes, it's not replacing the humans, but the key here is we're coming together and where us working together, computers and people, the, it's really that is making it a more inclusive human humane because now when you're interacting with people, it's more meaningful. It's what it, what it needs to be. Let the computers do the hard the machine learning, the algorithmic predictions, et cetera. And now you're able to act on it or you're able to be that, that escalation point in that. Let them do that stuff because now you can have that conversation with the patient and you can talk through the more human social element to it. And that's really what I was trying to convey here. It's just, it's not, you know, machines versus us. It's really how can we leverage? How can that make everyone's lives better? But the other thing that I wanted to touch on, though, is for any of you that are interested in careers in healthcare, how it's so different. So for anyone here that is already in healthcare, and, you know, what I would ask is, Thinking back to when you went to school or when you chose a career in healthcare, you might have thought different. You might have thought, I want to do it because, you know, I love surgery or I love working with people and, and trying to solve problems and making people better. And so now it's it, it, there, I think previously it was more the science behind it. You know, I like biology, but now there's so much communication and collaboration and analysis from that machine learning. So what is the machine telling you and now how do you correlate that and explain that to a patient? Or how do we think about everything that's happening in your life, everything around you to make you better? Because now it's more about what's your home situation and you know, is, is paying your copay a barrier for you or where you live, your transportation, or, so it's a much, um, and this is t completely my opinion, but I feel like you're seeing that shift in newer clinicians that it requires a lot more people skills, a lot more collaboration and communication because you know, people are huddling together, they're rounding, they're talking about patients, and, and all of that data is now served up so it's just a little bit different than it used to be. 
you know, in every role really requires great communicators. It goes back to the bedside manner. It really does. But it's just a little bit different because now we need people that embrace technology and are willing to trust technology and work with technology in the healthcare field. So I'm going to show you, I think we're right on time for a 7.45 break. I'm going to show you one more video because I think this is just an example for me of when you think about careers in healthcare, it's not just doctor, nurse, or you know, other types of careers. This is for Christiana Care, so we sponsored a hackathon in Wilmington, and so this is a, a video after the hackathon, but the key is all the fields in healthcare. So you have computer programmers, software engineers, you've got business analysts, and you've got, because as I said, when you think about the data scientists and all the data that's coming, so healthcare now looks completely different. Now, it's, there's so, so much health tech involved in everyone's jobs in a healthcare. Every single person has to interact in healthcare with technology, no one excluded. And so this is just an example because when we sponsored this hackathon, many people said, Christiana Care, why would you be sponsoring? And you'll see, you know, you'll see there, JP Morgan, Barclays, et cetera. But that's the shift that you're seeing. Yes, because we want to inspire these computer programmers to build solutions in healthcare. We want them to solve for today's toughest challenges. We want to inspire them. Don't just think about building apps. I'm going to build a gaming app, or I'm going to work at a bank and build apps. No, think about healthcare. There's, there's a lot of application development in healthcare, and there's a lot of startups in that healthcare space that we love working with because they're helping us solve. Because you know, our core business is taking care of people. That's really you know, our core focus, and that's why we love those kinds of partnerships. So this will just give you, a, it's a quick video uh, before we break. I'm gonna take a little shortcut here. Open the bracket and events like it, bringing the technologists to make the companies that are growing to get them work, but also exposing them to, to people locally that are doing that work. The competitors that are here today are actually coming from all across the United States. Oh,
the smart people. The number one reason people are here is because they think they're great at what they do, and they want to prove by being around others who think the same thing. So again, just an example of, you know, healthcare is changing. So why in the world would we sponsor a hackathon? Why would we bring, you know, and you saw we had coders from Harvard, MIT. Now our goal is we want coders from University of Delaware and charter school and we want community involvement and that's the shift that you're going to see for us in the Innovation Center. But we'll talk a little bit about that more after the break. So please take a break and maybe come back at 8 o'clock. Okay, so we'll go ahead and get started. All right, so I'm going to talk a little bit more specifically about the Health and Technology Innovation Center at Christiana Care. We are, as I said, located at Wilmington, and we are on the third floor of the hospital. So many people come up to the Innovation Center and are very surprised because you're going from patient care unit, patient care area, and then you come into our space, it looks very different. So that's, that's an example of our huddle. And there's Jason, my colleague, who is sitting right in the front row. You'll see, you know what? You might be wearing the same clothes yep. as that picture. <laughs> okay, all right, it's different, okay. Okay, so in the Innovation Center, I'm going to talk through a little bit about what we do. This is what, what the center looks like. Um, so you see we've got our offices, our desks, open seating, a cafe. It's a very configurable space to accommodate the different activities happening up there. In the Innovation Center, so as we heard in my introduction, we do have a team of developers, designers, analysts. In the Innovation Center, we, we are a scrum team. We're agile and that means we build things quickly and we keep our team pretty small so we try to keep our team under 10. It's not a huge innovation center because we flex up depending on the initiative that we're working on. If it's a new technology and we don't know it, we'll determine do we learn it? Is it strategic? Is it worth learning? Usually we'll learn it. And in that case, that's the commonality across all those roles in the Innovation Center is they are extremely flexible and love learning. They love to, to dabble, to take apart, to learn new things. And that is something when we interview for candidates, the things we look for, we want to hear stories about what gadgets you're buying. Oh, I just got the newest this. I'm fooling with my Echo device. And I, we love curiosity. We want people that are curious and always, always want to learn new things because the challenge is in this fast paced environment, it's not the right environment for someone who wants to master something. I want to be the expert at machine learning. I want to be the expert at virtual reality. Not that environment there because you move so fast. Because you're moving, it's, you know, it, and then it failed. And now you're moving on to a different project. So now what do you do with that? Now, if, if the virtual reality project had failed, well, was that a worthwhile investment for you to become an expert at that technology? We, we have an Alexa skill. So when you hook that Echo Dot up, you make sure that you enable the Christiana Care Alexa skill. And then you can ask Alexa all about Christiana Care. But when we launched that, that's, that was a, a project that, that we undertook. We didn't know anything about Alexa or the Amazon ecosystem. Had no idea. But that's why we do that. As we're researching it, we want to understand what does it take to build and launch an Alexa skill. Alexa, ask, you know, Christiana Care, do I need my flu shot this year? Okay, what we found out for us, what we found is it takes about an hour per question to program because we're thinking of it from the user. What are all the ways a user could ask if I need my flu shot this year? What are all the synonyms? What are, what's the slang that they could ask? How do we want to answer that? What are all the variations of that, et cetera? A lot goes into that, and that's why we do R&D. But that's also why we try to move as fast as we can. What's the minimum thing that we can test? What's our MVP? 
the minimum viable product. What's the smallest thing that we can launch? So when, when I give you that example of the virtual reality example, we didn't ask anyone to do anything. We took it, we built it, and then we took it out to the cancer center and we ran it. So you had engineers sitting with patients, putting the, the headset on them, when the patient was done, cleaning the headset. That is how we're able to work because we don't want to say, okay, change the nursing workflow because we want to try VR. That's, that's disruptive in a different way. We don't want to do that until we learn that this is even valuable because day one we could have gone out and it was a complete dud. Nobody wanted to do it. And that's also why we don't want to hire someone to build this for us. No, we don't want to do that because Again, it could be a complete dud. So what did we do? We went on a, web, a popular shopping website and we bought 360 cameras and we went out and somebody set it up in their backyard because they're really proud of their fountain and their garden features and recorded that. So we had different scenes because it's the what's the minimum thing that we can do to prove this out and then we get the ideas to add on as it's successful we keep adding and adding or pivoting but in this case that's the key so for anyone that's wondering you know what what type of person are you hiring for so we we just um, went through a round of interviewing and that's why it's fresh on my mind creativity and curiosity we feel like we can teach you the rest we can teach you the technology if you have a technical aptitude we're happy to teach you because what, what are we teaching you? We don't know at any given moment. Are we teaching, you know, a technology because that's what we're working on in this project? You know, we don't want to hire an expert at something. We need the foundation. And so that's what we love. We love people that just have that drive, that initiative, and they're going to work with a team to get stuff done and not get frustrated by failures and not get frustrated because they don't have time to master something. It's, I love to learn, I love Christiana Care, I love what you do, that's what we're looking for is people that want to make other people better, make them live better lives, healthier, or just increase their well-being. And that's, that's really the commonality across the, the people that are in the Innovation Center is they just, you know, for us, we, you had heard mention that we've built over 35 applications and I was saying during the break, so we can walk through the halls and see our applications in use. And that's so rewarding from a health tech perspective. That's why if you're going into the medical field, even if you're going in from a tech perspective, it's the most rewarding technical field you can get into, health tech. Because again, you're walking around seeing things that you built that are changing people's lives, that are really making an impact, that you look back and you say, oh, I built that. And what we do is we, because it's all about the user, we spend a lot of time shadowing. So we go out and we understand the environment that we're building for. That's very different. That's why I say it's a unique skill set because we have computer programmers that have to be willing to go into the emergency department and shadow a physician, an emergency medicine physician for an eight hour shift. Because guess what, it's not just about what does the system need to do, but it's everything around the system. It might feel different at the start of a shift than at the end of a shift. It might feel different on a Friday night versus a Wednesday afternoon. So we build always around the user, user-centered design that I'll tell you a little bit more about, but that's the key there. So we build apps. That's at the heart of it, what we're doing in the Innovation Center, absolutely. We, we do build apps. But we also cultivate ideas. We get a lot of people coming to us with ideas and we'll work with them to cultivate them. Sometimes it's, you know, there's already a system for that or maybe there's already a module we chose not to, to, to use but now you have a really great reason and we connect them or we build off of those ideas. And I mentioned, we also build partnerships and find startups. We love that. We love young entrepreneurs you know, young to the industry, not young in age, but just budding entrepreneurs that have an idea, have the energy, and are, are willing to put their all into helping us solve problems. 
how we do it. So one of the questions that I had was, how do we coordinate it to minimize duplicate or redundant efforts? And so that, we have a process for that. So we do prioritize efforts based on value. Everything we do ties back to our organizational goals. That's, that's our key. And, and you know, so I heard someone say today, if you can't measure it, it's not worth doing. So we, we measure it in whatever way makes sense. But the key is, but we also create a safe space for this because we don't want someone feeling like their career's on the line because they had this idea, they thought it was gonna be great, and it was a stinker. No one used it or it didn't produce the value that we thought. We help with that. That's why we do not consume resources in any way we're very self-contained so that it is a safe space. So you can come up with that crazy idea and we'll try it with you. That, that's the great thing. And then facilitating that cross-disciplinary collaboration, that is those, those multidisciplinary teams. So when we're building something, we really want different perspectives. So, you know, we want not the people only that are involved in the problem, but other people because and I'll give you another example. I was at South by Southwest a couple weeks ago. And again, you may say, South by Southwest, that's a music festival, or that's a film festival. No, huge health tech conference, which is awesome, in addition to many other. It's a huge augmented reality and virtual reality conference. It's a huge blockchain conference. It's a huge, you know, they have so many tracks now. But there was a speaker that I will, will not say because I see the camera pointed on me. But there was a presentation and they were talking about solving problems. And they said, you know, in this case, the problem was how do you get across a, a raging river? And, you know, you have your team that needs to get across the river. And why that cross-disciplinary collaboration is important. Having different people from different roles, different perspectives, different departments. Because their example was... I might need that fashion designer on my team because they might have an idea from a textile perspective of a rope that I can, can put together from all of our clothing to throw across and then we, we use the rope in that case. But that's the point. The point is you need different perspectives, absolutely, because somebody's going to have a crazy idea based on their experience you would have never thought of. And then again, so we now translate those ideas to implementation. if it has the potential for value. And so we leverage proven technology, so if you, or methodology, so I don't know if you've heard of design thinking, but that's where we approach the problem from a designer's lens. So we're not, we don't approach projects with, we know exactly how we're gonna solve it. Lots of post-it notes, lots of brainstorming, lots of drawings and sketches. We're actually in the middle of a design sprint right now and a design sprint, so right now our meeting room looks like that. That's not our current project, but it looks just like that. The entire room is filled with post-it notes. In three days, the entire room, you can't see through the glass. And that's because we're, we have to move fast. We can't have six months of meetings. We cannot meet and belabor this initiative. We got to lock ourselves in a room and we follow this methodology and it is a methodology initially developed at Google Ventures but it you make fast decisions you determine your problem statement and you do not leave that room so that's the methodology that we follow. And I mentioned we're, we are agile which means we don't go to you and say what do you need I'm gonna write down all of your requirements then I'm gonna leave you alone I'll be back in six months with everything you told me that you wanted. So that is a methodology. That's not our methodology. We are fast moving, incremental. So we wanna do something small, show it to you, get your feedback, maybe launch it. Now we're gonna add on to it. Because again, that's not my quote. I, I don't know who said it, but if you're not embarrassed by your first release, you waited too long. We can't get it perfect because how many times you know, do you change your mind over six months? I, I'm, I don't even know where my head was six months ago when I told you this is exactly what I needed and I was adamant about it. So we do that purposefully in the Innovation Center. To, every day we huddle. What did you do yesterday? 
What are you working on today? What are your barriers? And that's where the communication comes in because it's a lot of talking. It's a lot of talking. But it keeps us very connected and able to work fast. So you come up to the Innovation Center any morning at 8.15, we are huddling. And it's a little bit different because it's not, oh, it's the Innovation Center, we work from home, we bring our dogs in, it's so cool. To work fast, we, you know, we are all in the office. We are in that office at 8 o'clock, we are huddling at 8.15, and we're holding each other accountable. What did you do yesterday? Oh, well, I worked on, no, no. Specifically, what did you get done? Because I need to know, because today I might be working on that, or I might be waiting on that. So a lot of communication in the Innovation Center. And again, that user-centered design, the UX, user experience. It's all about the user. Our products would not be successful if we didn't think about the user first. And user-centered design. So when you think about that, think about who trains you on how to shop on Amazon. Nobody. Somehow you've all figured out probably how to shop online and you didn't have a training class and you didn't read a user guide and unfortunately it's way too easy to do. That's how we look at it. We think if we have to explain to you how to use our software, oh. we have extremely overcomplicated it. It's got to be intuitive. Sometimes you'll hear, oh, it's too many clicks. I need everything. Oh, that's the worst thing because now you've got everything in one place. Am I counting clicks on Amazon? I don't think I am. It's so intuitive. It's like they know me, but they do because now they're saying, you'll like this, or this is in your, your wish list. Hey, you left that in your shopping cart. It's, uh, you know, they're getting in your head, making you buy stuff. But that's what they're doing. It's about you as the user. It's not necessarily about the vendor that's putting products up there or, in this case, they're really great at that user experience. You could objectively step back and say, this homepage is way too crowded. This has so much stuff on it. But it still, it doesn't bother you necessarily. It depends on how, it doesn't bother me when I see that. It depends on how much you're, you're on Amazon. And then we do consulting. So as I said, we love it when people come up with ideas. Absolutely love it. We love it when startups come up with ideas or when students come up with ideas. Love that because again, we want to create this culture of innovation in our region and we want to support entrepreneurs. So again, we may connect people with, with different solutions. We might suggest people enter into our innovation challenge that we run. Or it could be that perfect scenario to test this device we just got in. Oh my God, we just, we have a robot kitty right now. It's a cat, it's a robot. And it is something that, you know, the headlines are, you know, you can do great things. So think about you're at home and maybe there's a loneliness factor or, um, you're just the type of person that you're close to your cat. You know, what could you do? Could you have the cat reminding you to take medications or is the cat just reducing anxiety? We don't know, but that's R&D. That's, we're looking at the device. It may never go anywhere. It may be, this was a fad, this is a toy, nothing of value there. Or it could be, you know what? This is a great extension for those patients that are more connected to, they're not connected to an echo device, they're not connected to maybe their family, a caregiver, because maybe they live alone, this, there might be value here. You never know. But we're always looking at, can you program against it? What's the battery life? Is this company gonna be in business six months from now? So R&D, so that's what it is. That's what the Alexa skill was. We just, you know, it's research. We're doing research. Is there value in getting in the voice user interface space? Is that really, we want to reach you in your home. We don't want you to have to come out. We, we're trying for that rapid convenience. So if you have, you know, there's millions of Echo devices in the U.S. now out in homes. That seems like a pretty good option for reaching you in your home. So that's why we're in that space. 
So we're doing all kinds of things. And every three months, if you come in, it's probably looking completely different. We, we never know what devices we're going to get. We've got another robot that's dispensing medications right now and allowing you to talk to your provider through it, through a video visit. Interesting. You know, we'll, we're assessing it to see where could we potentially trial that. And that was one of the other questions that I had is, how do we trial? Do, you know, can anyone walk in the Innovation Center and sign up to be a tester with us or trial? Right now, we do all of our R&D, our research and development activities with our caregivers at Christiana, and then they match up. The, the situation with the right patients for them. So if you think about that, that might be you saying to your primary care physician maybe, hey, if you ever need somebody to try that, that Apple Watch, you know, it may be, hey, I, you know, being an AFib patient, I would love to give you feedback on that device. That's when that provider will come to us and say, my patient told me about a new thing. Are, are we doing anything with that? If so, are you looking for people? that would be willing to give you feedback on it. We love that. And then in the Innovation Center, we do have a place for making, a makerspace. And in the makerspace, 3D printer, tools, et cetera, where we're prototyping. So in the Innovation Center, it's not all about software. I said, yes, we do build apps. That's our core competency. But there's a lot of other branches in the Innovation Center. And including workshops and educational activities. So throughout the week, we might be hosting a, a seminar on those, those things like design thinking or design sprints. Or we may, you know, coming back from a conference, now may have, you know, a host of robots that we want to introduce to, to caregivers across the organization. Or things like blockchain. You know, something like that where, okay, people are hearing about it in the news, now you're hearing more about blockchain and healthcare, that we may host a, a series on what you need to know about blockchain today, that kind of thing. But the other question that I had, this is great because I'm getting to answer based on the slides. Um, so this one is really related to that first question also about coordinating. How do you coordinate the efforts? We have a rubric. So we, whenever we get an idea come in, we always look at, can it be addressed by something that we already use? Maybe an area doesn't know another area is using it. So we help make those connections. Or do our existing strategic partners plan to address it? Is it on someone's roadmap? Is it already something available that we just don't know yet? Or could we build it together? And then we'll look commercially. But the key here is we never build anything that you can buy. So unlike other industries, we really rely on strategic vendors. And especially it, it, because in healthcare, we're all trying to do the same thing, make people's lives better. And so that's why it's also a great industry to be in, because we all have a common goal. We're not out for our own interests. We are out for your interests. How do we make you better? And if that means we can partner with another health system, or we can partner with a startup in a health system, that's what we want to do. And the only time we build it ourselves is if there are no other options and it holds the potential for great value. So that's the key there. And I mentioned we do an innovation challenge. So the innovation challenge allows our caregivers to submit ideas. So even if you think about you as a patient, you can absolutely talk to your provider. You know what you guys should be doing? You know, I had an idea love to get ideas from patients, from caregivers. So we have a whole process where staff submits ideas and then everyone votes on them. So you can like an idea, you can comment an idea, yes, and, or love that idea, that would make a huge difference in our area. Because when we host our Innovation Challenge finale, it's a pitch day, so we pick our finalists and they come and they pitch their idea to a panel of judges. So they come to a room like this, they have to pitch it, they have to sell it. And so there's another example. We never know what we're going to build because it depends on who wins the challenge. It could, the last winner of the challenge was another Alexa skill. So it was 
taking Alexa to the next step and making it personalized. But so now, you know, we're going deeper in Alex, the Alexa world. But it's interesting because someone else very easily could have won. The last challenge winner was uh, members from our intensive care unit. They had an idea for an app that sits on a code cart. So when a code blue is called, so someone has, has gone into cardiac arrest and the code cart comes out. So you hear, code blue, room one. The code cart comes out. Our app is now sitting on an iPad on that code cart because they won the challenge. <laughs> And, and so we had to immerse ourselves in the intensive care and cardiac arrest and very different for us. So again, you never know, but in healthcare, you are exposed to all of it. In any role, you never know where you're gonna be and you're gonna get a great perspective on the entire journey from a patient's perspective. So Innovation Challenge, but the last thing I want to tell you about is our website. So if it's piqued your interest or you want to share what we're doing with anyone, or you want to reach out and talk to us more, if you go to our website, christianacare.org, you can search on Innovation or Innovation Center, or you can go to innovation.christianacare.org, and it's got our contact info there, and a great video and some, some information about the projects that we're doing. So I feel like I have talked all of your ears off. I have a few more questions up here. So one of the questions is, do you believe in nanotechnology, microscopic robots, potentially opening up and displaying many types of surgeries and procedures? Um, or do you think that nanotechnology will merge with and advance medical procedures and surgeries? So nanotechnology is real. And I'll give, so, and, and nanotechnology, I'm gonna say it from a, a little bit of different perspective. We just wrapped up a pilot with an ingestible. So again, you know, that's a, a little um, tangential, but we were doing a pilot with a company that you would swallow the pill and, it would, and you'd wear a patch and it would send a message remotely whether you were taking your medication or not. So, and ingestible. So, so these things are really happening, and at Christiana we're doing them, and they are real. And to be determined where they go, but they are definitely happening now. Um, so the one question I touched on is, does Christiana Care set annual goals or annual targets to help drive innovation? And we absolutely do. So not just the Innovation Center, but the organization as a whole is very innovative. People are running different trials everywhere, doing research everywhere, and they're trying something and pivoting or tweaking, or we're always looking for ways to improve. But we do also have larger organizational goals that we all have responsibility for. So our goals are such that they're real to all of us. Does the Innovation Center need volunteers from the general public? That was the um, question I gave. So that's a speak with your caregiver. And so someone asked, a category on the, the venture scanner slide was gamification of health. Now you could argue that is a Pokemon Go. That falls into that category. That was more of an unintended consequence to that game that people started walking more. But that's what they mean. They mean a lot of the apps that you're seeing now, so it might be diabetes uh, management, are giving you goals, you're earning tokens or other prizes for managing your own care, for logging, uh, you know, uh, reading from a home health device or reading an educational material. You are still seeing that from a gamification perspective, but also you're seeing it broadening a little bit. Because again, would you have thought Pokemon Go was a health app? But it really is considered one because it was making people healthier. Unless you were like my son and you were hooking it to the ceiling fan and then it was going around. We, we won't tell him that I said that. Um, and then the last question that I had is twofold. 
how do I sync my iPhone with Christiana Medical Information? And whoever uh, asks that, if you have your phone with you, please stop up and I'll walk you through, or Jason and I'll walk you through. And um, will this video be available? And it absolutely will. So this video will be available on the Christiana Care website, minimally, um, along with the presentation. And I see the question was, and DelawareMiniMed.org. And I'm confident there'll be a link to it um, between both sites. And that's all the questions that I had, unless there's any more questions. If that last part kind of peaked aim it, if anybody has anything written down, or I don't know if it's appropriate to say, if you want to shout it out. So the question is, are the innovations going to bring down the cost of healthcare? That's our goal. That is ultimately our, our goal is to create efficient. So by making things more convenient for you, you're not consuming healthcare in the same way too. And, and it's this trickle down effect because one is maybe you don't need to go in as often as you do. Maybe you don't need your co-pays. Maybe you don't need to go to the emergency department. But then also it might be maybe you prevent, because of your preventive care, you've now avoided costs that you might have incurred. But that is absolutely our goal. Our goal is to make, and I'm saying to make people's lives better, because sometimes it's, it's getting healthier, feeling better, or sometimes it's just managing your care. But it is absolutely our guiding principle is what's going to make you better and whatever <laughs> better is for you. Another question. Have any of your innovations expanded into the home health care industry or long-term care facilities? So have our innovations expanded into home health care or long-term care? Um, none have. We, the, the, we actually had our home care team locked in a room with us this week. So we have a project um, that will be launching in the next six months, probably. Um, in a home health perspective that I can't give you a lot of detail on yet, um, but in part because we're designing it right now. But yes, absolutely, that's an area that we are very connected with in many ways because sometimes it's something we're building, other times it's R&D project, research and development projects that we're, we're trialing. Another question? Yeah, I, we talked about the innovations and it almost sounds like haphazard coming in from any way, you know, patient feedback. My question is, do you have overriding, does Christiana Care have overriding targets, annual or three-year goals mm -hmm. that drive innovation? So 3% cost efficiency over three years, 5% mm -hmm. reduction in turnaround time, reduction in paperwork, reduction in repeat patient visits. Do you have any of those targets that, that help drive specific innovation? So do we have, I'll summarize, do we have overarching specific targets for Christiana Care that drive innovation? Absolutely we do. I can't share with you the details of what those organizational goals are, but we absolutely do. And we have short term and we have long term. And the great thing is that the head of innovation at Christiana is also the head of our strategy and planning department and he's our CIO. And he's amazing. But that really keeps us connected. Now also, the Innovation Center has a governing body. And our governance council is not headed by that person that I mentioned. Our governance council is headed by our chief people officer. And then we have representatives from all across the organization that keep us in line with always making sure this is contributing towards the overall goals. And we, we are responsible for that. We're responsible for always kind of driving how is this helping us meet our goals? What, how is this? So even all of that that comes in, again, we never know what it's going to be, but that is kind of the, the thread across everything is when I say value, the value is in meeting our organizational goals. But I, I confidently, confidently say, absolutely, it is. If you talk to anyone in the Innovation Center, really, if you talk to anyone in the organization, our goals are out there for all of us to walk, live, breathe. Any other questions? 
Well, good. I'm, I'm giving back Thank some time. Good. Thank, Thank you so much for coming.